the moral test of government is how it treats those who are in the dawn of life, children, those who are in the twilight of life, the aged, and those in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. Our long-term care system has suffered from a tremendous underinvestment, which means that we are not meeting that moral test. The coronavirus represents a threat to everybody in the world. The most challenging crisis we have faced since uh, the Second World War. You can actually smell fear. You smell death. Hospitals are filled and rapidly running out of supplies. Just breathe the air. That's how it's passed. This is deadly stuff. The United States being the hardest hit country in the world. Are elderly people now disposable in this society? We knew it was coming. Tonight, Washington stayed on edge after seeing the first U.S. death from the coronavirus. The number of deaths from coronavirus virus in Washington state uh, rising to 13 overnight. 11 of those deaths stem from one nursing home. 29 people associated with this facility have died. This morning, Washington state remains the center of attention as the coronavirus spreads quickly. All of the deaths so far involve elderly patients or patients with underlying health issues, most linked to a Seattle area senior center. Beginning in February 2020, American nursing facilities encountered a situation not unlike 9-11. Only there were no firefighters rushing to the scene, no emergency exits for the elderly and disabled unable to flee, no rescue teams. There was only an invisible virus and neither government nor health systems were prepared to help. As soon as we saw cases that were taking place in Kirkland, we should have recognized that this is an alarm bell that you know is not just you know specific to one care facility, but actually has uh, repercussions across the U.S. Nursing homes have borne the brunt of the coronavirus pandemic in this country. Nursing homes have been at the epicenter of the outbreak since the very beginning. So is it getting better or worse? The crisis in nursing home and long-term care facilities will account for a huge swath of the American death toll, unless something is done to address this systematically. Kim died of COVID. Kim's death certificate says COVID-19 is her cause of death. I'm angry because I wasn't informed. I'm angry because of the lies that I know that were told, that were coming out in the media. I'm angry because I know my sister suffered. I'm angry because I believe that Kim would still be here if the proper infection controls were used. And I feel like my sister was looked at as another number and not the person that she was. I just always thought my dad was invincible. I never ever thought about my dad not being my dad. <laughs> I think we're all struggling to figure out how it is that our country has botched the response to this pandemic as badly as it has. It's been an unmitigated disaster. It became readily apparent pretty early on how much was at stake. I mean, when we saw what happened in Washington state, we knew the potential for this. I can't tell you the number of times I've been on phone calls with colleagues from other parts of the country, and they're telling me that they had to get a refrigeration truck because they didn't have enough room for the bodies of their clients who have died. I was on a call with a colleague who told me she was sewing body bags because they ran out of body bags. This is as difficult as it gets. And in our industry, this is life or death. Every decision we make is life or death. The nursing home population is 0.5%, a half a percent of the population, and it's contributing 40 to 50% of the deaths. Close to 2,300 Pennsylvanians have died from COVID-19, and half of those deaths have been in nursing homes or long-term care facilities. People weren't thinking about nursing homes. They didn't make a big concerted effort to get uh, protective equipment to them, to begin testing staff, begin anything. But the nursing homes were kind of always an afterthought. We feel like we've been forgotten. The front lines are in nursing homes. So if we don't stop it in nursing homes, we're not gonna stop it in hospitals. And so far the country just hasn't figured that out. There's inadequate staffing, inadequate PPE, inadequate equipment, and a lack of guidance. As we watched this virus roll out, we were caught in a terrible bind because we were learning as we were flying the airplane. My colleagues and I bet were three things. One, protective equipment. Two, testing, testing, testing. And three, support, because we need other people to go into those homes when the staff are too sick. In the span of a month, nearly everybody in the building gets infected and a quarter of them die. 
from something that could have been prevented if everybody did what they were supposed to do earlier, better, more forcefully, more thoughtfully. So here you have a pandemic, which I don't think anybody would disagree is a medical problem. So shouldn't the government, both state and federal, have an infection control position right by their side at every single meeting, maybe running the meeting? But that didn't happen. Why didn't that happen? There has been a desire to somehow will the virus away, just act like if we ignore it, it will go away. Unfortunately, the virus cannot be intimidated. The virus cannot be ignored. The virus cannot be willed away. The virus is what it is. It's a biological agent. You can't intimidate it. You can only understand its rules and fight it based on those rules. The initial response was to turn to the federal government for a plan. Had states and the federal government started acting in mid-February, lives would have definitely been saved. So when the federal government declared a national emergency, they took on the responsibility of addressing that national emergency, putting in place the procedures, the supplies, the protocols, everything that was needed in order to protect citizens of this country. They didn't do that. I think they didn't do it because there was no coordination at the top. We have been on our own dealing with this virus and trying to keep our residents safe. Nursing homes and assisted living facilities are digging into their own supplies, donating and delivering personal protective equipment to other harder hit facilities. We had nothing and people were improvising because the science was perverted, because the messaging coming out confused people, because we didn't have any national response. And that is, I can't think in my lifetime I can't think of any other circumstance where this could have happened, where this response would have happened. Once the horror of the moment set in, the search for blame began, and nursing home owners, operators, and staff were easy targets. But even the best managers and frontline workers were desperate for help, and they deserved our guidance and support, not incrimination and accusation. This was an invisible enemy that turned their facilities into killing fields. These heroes did everything they could, but no one came to fight with them. Had we taken a coordinated national strategy approach to this, maybe we wouldn't be reaching such a milestone today. I think you also have to recognize what a perfect environment for this virus the nursing home is. It's full of people who are immune compromised. They're 85 and older. They already have a number of comorbid underlying conditions. They're living in close quarters, often in older buildings that have not the best, most modern air circulation. And they're being seen in and out of the rooms all day long by different people. It means that it's a pure sort of petri dish for viral spread. You know, the place where it makes sense where this is introduced in nursing homes is by staff members. You have asymptomatic staff members who are coming into nursing homes and it's not their fault. You have a real challenge when the caregivers are the ones that are bringing the illness to the people that they're caring for. My dad had tested positive. So he had to have caught it from a staff member. I was devastated. You know, I'm grateful that my dad is still here and that he's still fighting, but there's basically been no rest since March. How can you control the spread of this if you cannot give the people providing the care proper equipment? That's like the basic, very first thing. Everything stemmed from the incredible lack of foresight and planning as it relates to the PPE, personal protective equipment stockpile in the United States, which is a federal responsibility. If staff members got sick or tested positive, residents got sick or tested positive, and then residents died. The only way to stop that is through point of care testing. How do you know if there's an asymptomatic person walking through that door with a temp of 97, who has no cough, no sore throat, they're eating fine and they feel fine, yet we know that they can still carry the virus. One of the hot spots for the outbreak continues to be Beaver County's largest nursing home. And now Brighton Rehabilitation and Wellness Center says it is presuming all staff and residents may be positive. I can't imagine the kind of 
moment to moment fear, it had to be overwhelming. I know the nurses and I know the CNAs and, I, and like I said, I personally can testify how much they care about the residents. And that's what I liked, that they cared about them so much. But they couldn't do everything on their own. And it was clear they're understaffed. There are a whole host of workforce issues, underinvestment in training, oftentimes a lack of career ladders, simply not paying enough to attract people into this sector. There's just an ideology out there that is like, we have to have an economy that works, so someone's gonna get sick and someone's gonna die. And it just feels like in the richest country on the planet, we ought to be able to figure out how to you know, have a society where people can live to their fullest potential and, and health being front and center seems really important to me. Americans are dying in huge numbers, in concentrated places that we can see and identify and help if we choose. Although some nursing homes could have done better, the overall blame falls to a nation that has proven indifferent and insensitive to the care of its most vulnerable citizens. Residents of these facilities deserve a level of care and skill that government reimbursement simply doesn't support. Our long-term sector cannot provide the quality of care these residents deserve because it lacks the necessary resources that our hospital systems have in abundance. So the whole healthcare system has shifted. So care that used to be in hospital now often is in the nursing home level. Care that used to be in the nursing home level now is often in personal care or assisted living. And people who used to live in those sort of retirement home settings are often now in the community receiving home and community-based services if and when they need them. I think the single largest issue is really the underfunding of Medicaid clients in nursing homes, nursing facilities. There is a huge variance between what we are paid for a day of care for a Medicaid client in a nursing home and what it costs us to provide that care. For most organizations, that shortfall is at least $100 a day per person. Someone has on average 70 Medicaid clients in a nursing facility and their shortfall is $100 per day per person. That's well over a million dollars a year in a gap just for one facility who has 70 Medicaid clients. So if you take that million dollar plus shortfall for that one facility and multiply it by the number of nursing facilities there are around the country, that's in the billions of dollars. As reimbursements have been flat the last five years in Pennsylvania where there hasn't been an increase in the Medicaid program for nursing homes, healthcare inflation keeps going up. So it's created a much more intense challenge for, for providers in general. But if you have the largest public payer basically paying rates barely cover the costs of care. It's hard to attract capital to that market. It's hard to pay workers. And it's hard to meet those quality standards. In what system and what business does that work? It doesn't. This issue of underfunding, particularly as it relates to Medicaid clients, was a very significant issue going into COVID that has now completely been exacerbated by COVID-19 because of the increased costs associated with safely caring for those same individuals. There's a direct correlation, a direct connection between an inadequate Medicaid payment system and the challenges of workforce and stability and quality. You know, oftentimes people say, anytime you're trying to understand how a system works, to follow the money and see where the money is directing people's attention. And historically, there's never been any need for hospitals to focus outside of the hospital. In a healthcare system that is broken, that's very broken, we're trying to do the right thing. And I think it's important for everyone to recognize that just because someone reaches a certain age doesn't mean they don't have a quality of life and doesn't mean that we as a society should not provide them with as many supports and services as we can to help ensure that they have that quality of life every day. They deserve it. And there has been this pervasive talk in the last few months that it somehow doesn't matter that people are dying if they're older. We should be doing everything possible to save people's lives. Yes, including the lives of older people. I think that as a society, as a world, I think there's just enormous amount of ages, a lack of respect, a lot of stereotyping, a lot of discrimination against older adults. We are not a society in the US that has revealed its elders. 
you know, ageism is true in our healthcare systems. It's just seeps into our society. There is, I think, a, a lot of feelings out there that, well, you know, they're just old and they have memory loss and, you know, they're not important, which is sickening, but a lot of people feel that way. The sign of a civilized society is how it takes care of the people who are unable to speak for themselves. Nursing homes and long-term care facilities from the start of this pandemic have been hotbeds of illness and death. One study shows 41% of coronavirus deaths in 36 states are connected to nursing homes. Over 3,600 deaths up from just a few hundred in a matter of days. It's an alarming rise. What is behind that rise? It's incredibly alarming, and if you can believe it, it's actually an underestimate. What's behind it is just how deadly this virus is in nursing homes. We have older adults with high levels of chronic illness. When this gets started in a nursing home, it's incredibly harmful to the population. It appears, honestly, that it, that it was all these factors, all at the same time, coming together from very broad national policy decisions that were made maybe decades ago, to very granular, small decisions made within the building. And that combination, unfortunately, coalesced into the absolute worst case scenario. You look at a system that is very fragile, that was sort of hanging on by the fingernails already, and then COVID happens. This is a wake up call and it's time for us to very specifically and dramatically say to ourselves, we want to change for the better for the future. We need to hear from our leaders the importance of valuing life and the importance of saying that people matter and we're not going to take a strategy of sacrificing one chunk of our population so that another chunk of our population can work. We as a generation should feel a tremendous amount of gratitude and respect to the older population and we should take it as a responsibility to come up with solutions that provide them with the care, the safety, the respect that they deserve. Instead of just thinking about how do we just keep people alive, we start thinking a lot about things like functional status and managing of pain and making sure that people are active in their communities in a way that lets them have very rich lives so that it's not just about, oh, can we eke out another six months or another year? If you're thinking about somebody who's, let's say, 70 and think that person's got two more decades ahead, totally changes how you think about prevention, how you think about chronic disease management, how you think about caring for people. I would tell Kim that I love her and that the bond that we have and the fight that my mother instilled in us is still here. I would tell her that I will continue to fight for her I will continue to be her voice. And I will tell her your name will never be forgotten. Your life was not in vain. And that your death is going to make a difference for somebody, somehow, that no one else will be treated the way that Kim was treated. And I know that she would be proud to make a difference for somebody else. She would be proud of that. We can't undo the harm that's been done. We cannot bring back the dead, but we can honor them by fixing the problem, by improving how we care for them when they cannot care for themselves. We need new models of care. We need more resources to allow for good care. We need the right regulations and accountability, not simply more piling on. Ask your governors, your state legislators, your Congress members to honor the tens of thousands of seniors who may die of COVID-19 during the pandemic by redesigning and reinvesting in better equipped, more satisfying, adequately staffed residential facilities for our frailest citizens. Someday they, the frail who require special care, will be you.